All right, guys, this week for the big episode, we, we have Dr. David Whitcomb. Okay, guys, it's going to be a great conversation. Before we jump in, let's talk about our scripture, 2 Timothy 2.2. Two, okay, 2 Timothy 2.2. Two, two. We covered it in the spiritual kickoff. Go back and check that out if you haven't yet. But it says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of, of many witnesses and trust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Okay, guys, there's your scripture. Now, Dr. Whipcomb is an academic physician, scientist, and entrepreneur. This guy does it all. But he's big into mathematics, gen genetics, neuroscience, clinical sciences, and he studies complex inflammation disorders. So, guys, this is a little bit different of an episode, just to be honest with you. His book was the autobiography of his father. And his father was John Wickham. And he wrote some wonderful books. And the one he's most famous for is The Genesis Flood. The listeners out there that enjoy history, apologetics, this is your episode. You know, if, if you are right now in the world and you hear follow the science, what should you say? This is what we talked about. So it's a great conversation. So guys, I'm not going to hold you back any longer. Let's get into it. David, welcome to The Lion Within Us. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, very excited to have you, sir. Very excited to have you. So, you know, just to share with us a little bit for, for our listeners out there, a little bit about your background, where you're from. We just like to get to know you a little bit before we get going too deep. I'm a Hoosier. Okay. I was born and raised in rural Indiana in a small town called Winona Lake that was the home for Grace Theological Seminary, where my father was a professor and uh, his academic career was, was uh, only at Grace Seminary. So uh, I grew up in rural Indiana and uh, had a chance to uh, observe him and learn from him for many years until I went away uh, to college and got married and medical school and graduate school and my own career. So uh, uh, that's sort of my background. Okay. So where was college and, and, and your, your education? Where did you go? Well, I started at Grace College, which was started as a prep school for Grace Theological Seminary. Okay. And uh, during that time, I had a, uh, a friend who uh, told me that um, he needed me to take a class in organic chemistry so that there would be enough people to offer it. Uh, and I said, why would you take organic chemistry? And he said, because I want to go to medical school. And I said, don't you have to be like a genius from Harvard to go to medical school? He said, no, you just take this test called the MCAT. And if you do good, you get in. And so I thought, I'm smart as this guy. And uh, so I took the course and um, did well and then took a course in human anatomy and physiology. That was my uh, decision really to go into medicine. I, I just thought that was absolutely incredible. It was my fifth major in college. I had been a history major and failed a business major, and I hated it, a chemistry major. I couldn't see myself as a chemist, a uh, art major, which I liked, but I was too slow and didn't have any talent. So uh, I ended up in, in uh, pre-med, which Grace College didn't have. I went to um, then Manchester College for two reasons. One is to get a new, uh, to start over on my GPA, which was horrible. And secondly, is that many of the courses that I needed were not offered at Grace College. So mm -hmm. um, then I went from there to Ohio State, got a master's degree and a PhD in physiology, Went to medical school as an independent study student and then went to Duke University for internship in internal medicine, a residency in internal medicine, a GI fellowship and postdoctoral training, and then was recruited to the University of Pittsburgh uh, 31 years ago. Oh, wow. So so you, you had a stint at Duke? I did. it. I was there for six years. OK, because that's right down the road. I'm in I'm based out of North Carolina. So Duke University is literally right down the road from us. Yeah, I was able to get 10 years of uh, training in the first three years. So it was pretty rigorous. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, Duke is, is highly accredited, obviously, is one of the, the top hospitals regions in the, in the, in the country. So that, that's what a story. So you, and you've been in Pittsburgh for 31 years? Yes, I have. Okay. So you transitioned from Indiana to Ohio to now Pittsburgh. So you, you covered a gamut when it comes to sports teams, right? Yes. <laughs> I always loved sports, but I was uh, uh, too slow and uncoordinated. And uh, so uh, 
I decided to do something else and it took me a while to figure out what it was. Right. Right. Well, you figured it out. Congratulations to you, sir. And and I, and I know today we're going to be unpacking your your the book that you wrote, A Good and Faithful Servant. And guys, check out the links in the show notes because we'll be promoting this book hard this week because it, it was a really just a phenomenal read. And and I'd love to get your take, and, you know, Dr. Wilkin, on, on on the story and, and the, the process. You know, what was the best part of writing your your father's you know autobiography? You know, um, probably the, the best part for me is, uh, a chance to really connect with my father in a little bit different level than I did as a child. Mm -hmm. So, uh, growing up, uh, two, uh, things were, I think were important that molded my childhood. Uh, the first one is that, uh, my mother became ill with a liver disease and uh, ended up dying when I was 14 years old. And mm -hmm. so she had a, a 10 year uh, illness. And uh, so that was um, very impactful. The second thing was uh, unbeknownst to anybody at the time, I had uh, pretty severe ADHD and dyslexia. Mm. So I flunked kindergarten and I just couldn't follow directions and was um, in trouble all the time, kept getting you know, uh, my parents called in for meetings. And so I think I was a great academic disappointment, uh, to my father. And, um, I just really struggled in school. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that was, that was just terrible. As a matter of fact, when I was in junior high school, um, my teachers in, uh, my regular classes, the first time, you know, I was in a large class that moved from classroom to classroom. Uh, for different subjects, uh, I suggested that I be transferred to the um, MR room uh, for training, which is I knew was mentally retarded. Mm. Uh, my guidance counselor said that I was not college material and should consider a career in landscaping or gardening. And um, so uh, the uh, uh, there was one teacher by the name of Mr. Brenneman who was a biology teacher, and he argued for me, I didn't know it at the time, uh, that nobody who is one of the best chess players in the school can be an idiot, and suggested that I was bored and should have be placed in advanced math and advanced um, biology. Right. And so they allowed that for a trial. And I did extremely well in those courses. And you know, rose to the top of those classes. And in retrospect, uh, understanding a little bit more about dyslexia is I realized that the advanced courses teach differently. Mm -hmm. It's not based on extensive reading and trying to listen to lectures and take notes, which I can't do at the same time. Um, and so uh, it was just a different approach and, and one that sort of ran well with me. And, and uh, so I was able to struggle through you know, junior high school and high school, I got into Grace Sem or Grace College on probation. Mm -hmm. I worked really hard and just still had a C minus average, and just you know wanted to stay eligible to play soccer. Right. So um, then in college, uh, on a very cold night, I went to my dorm and um, with my hands were freezing cold because I didn't have gloves and had to scrape ice off my windshield with my fingers and uh, to drive home from work. And uh, some guys are drinking coffee. So I picked up a cup of coffee and started sipping it. And I thought, boy, this actually tastes pretty good. And I had a second one, went back, opened up my textbooks, and it was like the words suddenly jumped off the page and I could understand what I was reading for the first time. And uh, so I didn't have uh, Aldorol or, you know, any of the medications for, for uh, ADHD and dyslexia. But for some reason, ca the caffeine just, connected and uh so ever since then i drink you know multiple pots of coffee a day and three or four monster drinks and my wife's horrified but it really helps All right you just need Otherwise, that caffeine you need that caffeine to get going but it somehow connects the uh the brain yeah uh, in a way that doesn't connect right without it so uh, you know i don't know exactly how it works but it's allowed me to have a career there you go. Well, that's very fascinating. Very fascinating. So I'm curious, though, on, on the book itself, 
your dad, it's it started out with the Genesis flood, and maybe for our listeners who don't know, you know, Doctor Wickham about that that piece of work, would you mind unpacking that a little bit and sharing about the Genesis flood and you know how that came to be and and, and how that has served the Christian community in so many ways? Yeah. So, um, uh, my father became world famous uh, when he co-authored the Genesis flood with Henry Morris, and uh, my father was a theologian, uh, and uh, Henry Morris was uh, a scientist. Uh, so they got together to write this book. Um, the book was written at a time when almost zero Christians believed a literal interpretation of Genesis, and they were all evolutionists. Uh, often what they called the gap theory. Mm -hmm. And that's where there was um, God created the heavens and the earth millions and millions of years ago in verse one. And then in verse two, he reshaped the earth and uh, it was covered with waters and all the dinosaurs and all the creatures and everything from all those ages gone by were, were buried. And then he recreated things um, in a new way. And, and, uh, through forced evolution and somehow, you know, the pieces came together. And so the six days are sort of long time periods and right. those kinds of things. And that was really the, the, the viewpoint of, uh, of uh, everyone in the world. There were some and Christians who uh, were literal creationists and it was really led by the seventh day Adventist. And the reason they stuck to a seven day uh, creation was that their founder, uh, uh, her name was White, uh, was supposedly getting messages from God where she was given the interpretation from God. And in one of the things she said that God said that seven days, and so they hold it not for textual reasons, but because their founder said that's what it is. And they should have the seventh day as a Sabbath, which is Saturday and not Sunday. And Mm -hmm. So other things that she enforced. Right. Uh, there were a few uh, conservative Lutherans that also argued for um, a six-day creation, but it was pretty much dismissed. As a matter of fact, there was a, an organization called the American Scientific Association, which was a group of Christians who were trying to figure out how to weave uh, the evolution story into the Bible. And uh, they actually had a book celebrating Darwin that came out uh, to try to do that. Wow. Okay. So my father. And a timeline for this would be, just, just set the timeline for listeners. Yeah, this is 19, this is, uh, uh, so the, the controversy really began with Darwin uh, in the uh, 1850s, 60s uh, time point. And uh, then in the 1920s was the monkey trial, Scopes monkey trial, uh, where um, the theory of evolution and the uh, scripture uh, were clashed in the classroom and the creationists lost uh, because uh, the, the person that was supposedly an expert in the Bible conceded that Genesis could be millions and millions of years. And that mm -hmm. was the end of that. So uh, from 1928 uh, until the publication of the Genesis Flood, there was almost nobody that, uh, uh, you know, argued for a uh, six-day creation with the exception of uh, uh, George Critty Price, who was a Seventh-day Adventist. But the arguments he had for that were weak from a biblical standpoint and weak from a scientific standpoint. Mm. And so he was easily criticized even though he's a brilliant man and a, a prolific author. Um, so um, my father, uh, when he went to Grace Seminary, uh, he, he went, originally went there in 1948 with the intention of being a missionary to China because he had grown up there and learned Mandarin as a child. But uh, Mao Zedong, uh, Communist Party, took over the country, killed uh, the missionaries and Christians and expelled all foreigners. And so he had no other plans. He had nothing to do. So the president of the seminary said, you know, we just had uh, our Old Testament professor resign. Why don't you take over by teaching Old Testament? 
so he was assigned to teach the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, uh, Greek, excuse me, a Hebrew exegesis. Uh, so how do you study the Hebrew language and interpret it? And then some other Old Testament stuff, because his uh, training at Princeton had been in uh, ancient uh, history. And so uh, mm. he, he was assigned those things. Well, when you start reading Genesis 1-1 in the Hebrew and translating it, it just says, God created the heavens and the earth. Right. And it says in six days in morning. And so the more he read it, you know, and he had to teach the class. He just said, well, you know, that's what it says. So, there, so if the Bible is true, then the, the alternative evolution has to be wrong. And so for his doctoral thesis, he went from Genesis to Revelation and looked up every single passage that had any type of a comment about the creation or the Genesis flood and carefully translated it and looked at the context and looking at the whole Bible, he found there was a single narrative from Genesis to Revelation, and that was God created the heavens and the earth in six days out of nothing, not reformed it, out of nothing. And then he destroyed the world that then was with a global flood that lasted for at least one year. Mm -hmm. And Noah and his family were saved in an ark. Now, my father heard a talk with Henry Morris, and he, and it, Morris, who had a PhD in hydrodynamics, that's basically what can moving water do as far as carrying sediment and right. the kinds of forces, and had a master's degree in geology. And his contention was, if you just look at the earth and the layers, it says global flood as described in Genesis. It explains all of the strata and layers and everything. So my dad said, well, that that makes a lot of sense. And, and so he wrote his doctoral thesis on that. The problem was is that he couldn't get it published because he was told since his doctorate was in theology, he was not allowed to speak on science. Mm. And so uh, Henry Morris, uh, he contacted Henry Morris and said, would you please help me? He says, I feel like it's a battle between the elephants and the whales. Uh, where you just can't fight on someone else's turf. That's right. And, and so they joined together, and uh, Henry Morris had been working on a book as well. And uh, so they joined forces and really worked to rewrite each other's stuff and make sure it was it was correct. And in 1961, it was published as a technical defense of the Bible. and. Christian scientists and engineers began reading it, and they said, this is the answer. The authority is, this is what God said, and he said nothing else. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is what he said. And if we believe it, then how do we understand a world and life view based on what we're hearing from the evolutionists? And the answer is, is that it's a lie. There was no such thing as natural evolution. And if you look at the evidence, it says creation and a flood. Right. So, so that the, the fact that uh, it was argued with what's called a presuppositional approach to apologetics, mm -hmm. in other words, you don't say, here's my philosophy of why I believe there's a God. And if there is a God, what is he like? And, you know, that kind of argument is bound to fail because it, those philosophical thoughts are uh, distorted by sin nature, and you, can, you can't figure it out by itself. Mm -hmm. Instead, you start with, God said, because the only thing we know that's pure and true is the scriptures. So you start with the scriptures and announce, this is what God said, and show where he said it. Right. And that was the correct approach. So. Uh, what my father did, and he got this information, this idea from a guy named um, Cornelius Van Til, mm -hmm. that um, 
really you 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 need to do uh, inductive Bible study rather than deductive, and then you'll end up uh, more likely in the right place. And so those that argument that approach really resonated with Christians who said, "I have confidence that that's what the Bible said." And now right. I'll go back to science and look at the evidence. <clears throat> That's great. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back, guys. I get a chance to talk to guys every week. And one consistent struggle that keeps rising is the lack of community. To address this, we created the Lion's Den to start building a community, of Christian brothers, with the aim of serving them resources to combat the darkness. We are working hard to bring encouragement, inspiration, and tips to help you be the leader you're predestined to be. As part of the Lions Den, you'll also be first in line with new opportunities, events, and resources that are designed to serve you in your journey. So hop over to thelionwithin.us to sign up for the Lions Den for free. That's thelionwithin.us and become a member of the Lions Den today. So, so I'm curious, Dr. Dr. Wickham, the, the inductive versus the, the what did you say, inductive versus reductive? A deductive. Deductive. So, okay. Yes. So inductive is you read what the Bible says. Okay. You make sure you interpret it correctly, and then you apply it. Mm -hmm. so it's observation, interpretation, application. Okay. That's inductive Bible study. Okay. Deductive is I believe that you know such and such is true, and I'm going to go look for some verses to support my ideas. Right. Now, for 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 your father, from what I remember reading the book, he, when he worked on this study, he was doing a lot of the editing that Dr. Morris was. So it was kind of like it seemed like it was a lot of ping pong back and forth on the actual development of the great the uh, the Genesis flood. True. OK. And um, so the book uh, that I, I wrote that really outlined his life goes into that in in uh, detail mm -hmm. showing the providence of God as a young man grew through different circumstances was being molded by invisible hands mm -hmm. to be one of the few people in the world that could have written this book right right his father who was not a believer who was a, a high ranking military officer uh, fought in World War One and World War Two, um, was concerned about him and sent him to a military academy called Macaulay School. Uh, but Macaulay School had a Christian headmaster, and uh, so my father became acquainted with the Bible there. But he learned how to study, and learned discipline, and then got early acceptance to Princeton University. Right when he got to Princeton University, uh, he signed up for geology because he had traveled all over the world as a an army brat because the you know army officers get moved every three years and so that's how he ended up in China and and uh, Fort Leavenworth and Fort Bragg and around the world so he liked maps and countries so he signed up for it but it turned out it was the leading experts on paleontology and evolutionary geology. And so he ended up studying under the masters to really see how they approached it all, and took all their courses and really learned a lot. And he wasn't a believer at the time. At the end of his freshman year, uh, he had been attending a Bible class led by a man named Donald Fullerton, uh, who started the Princeton Evangelical Fellowship. And my mm -hmm. father uh, was saved, he accepted Christ, and everything changed. He decided he was not going to be an ambassador, which he and his parents had wanted him to be, but rather an ambassador for Christ, and he wanted to go back to, to China. Mm. However, Uncle Sam called him and said, you know what, we're running out of soldiers for World War II, so we're cleaning out all the colleges, and we're drafting all the young men, and um, then uh, we'll send them off. Right. But uh, he was qualified for an advanced program uh, that allowed some individuals uh, from the top colleges to study um, how to follow the army and to uh, go into a town that was captured and the army goes on and the old leaders are gone. So you have to have a provisional government. 
you have to understand the culture, the people, the language, the administrative things. And so he wanted to do that. Right. But he was short on courses because he had taken these geology courses. So they said, you know what? You did really well on your IQ course, so we're going to send you to engineering. He says, I hate engineering. And he wrote his dad and he says, they're forcing me to go against my will. And his dad, who was not a believer, said, son, sometimes a higher power, in capital letters, right, has um, a higher, uh, greater plans for you and understands things that you don't understand. So like a good soldier, you know, suck it up. Go suck it up. Take it. Right, right. So he was trained in geology, paleontology, and in uh, the hard sciences of engineering and physics and mathematics. So when he was writing the Genesis Flood, he could review and understand the scientific arguments. Yes. But it turned out that he wasn't really a scientist, so he wasn't familiar with the technical aspects of conducting research and and uh, arguing for it. But Henry Morris was. Right. And so he could he could critically review Henry Morris's sections and say what's a strong argument and weak argument and what doesn't make sense and those kinds of things. So he really edited it line by line. On the flip side, Henry Morris was a devout Christian, heavily involved in the Gideons and witnessing and Bible studies, but he was no theologian. And yeah. he did not know how to how to defend the Bible. His approach was, uh, when I look around and I see the complexity of animals, I just realize there must be a God. Well, that's, that's uh, uh, not convincing. The convincing argument is God wrote the Bible. It is inerrant, and this mm -hmm. is what it says. That right. is the correct approach. And so both of them could... Uh, had working knowledge of the other's discipline, but wasn't an expert. But between mm. the two, they had expertise in both areas and critical reviewers, so that the stuff they wrote was accurately reviewed and was tied together as one unit. I mean, it sounds like they were the ultimate team working together because because they their their skill sets complemented each other very well. You're exactly right, and and what you what I learned in writing this book is the hand of God in preparing someone who mm -hmm. was totally committed to him. Right. Absolutely. Now, I'm curious, when we hear, we hear oftentimes, follow the science, you know, follow the science. What would your dad say to that? Follow Christ. That simple, huh? You, you know what? The, uh, you hear follow science, and that term is used as a to bully people yeah. into accepting things that they may not fully understand. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a scientist. I've uh, published over 400 scientific papers, gone through the critique. I was an editor of a major journal. Right. So I know how science works, and I know what the strength of evidence is. And I realized that uh, there are several different types of scientists as well. Right. Uh, so, uh, when I hear follow the science, um, I want to know what the data is and what the conclusions were. And a lot of times it's, you know, it's people arguing to follow the science that don't under the science, don't understand the science. They have a political agenda or another one, and they're trying to say, well, the scientists say, and mm -hmm. they're right. There are some scientists that are saying that, but they, they are not rigorous and accurate and fully truthful. You wouldn't jump in a boxing ring and expect to win without training, right? So why do you think you can win the battle against Satan without putting in the work? For the Christian man, it starts with knowing scripture and your heart. To help you out and get started with your training, we created a free guide of 10 scriptures you need to fight like a lion. Go grab this free resource, and I'm going to come alongside of you in a series of personal and engaging messages designed to challenge and help you grow. So get equipped today with scripture that will help you fight the battle you're in. Visit thelionwithin.us to get started today. That's thelionwithin, 
us to unlock this free guide you need to fight like a lion. Hey, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back, guys. Dr. Whipcomb, when, I, when I'm thinking through the adversity that your, that your father had probably faced, you know, with bringing out the Genesis flood and standing, standing, you know, on, the, on what it was telling people, he probably had a lot of challenges. He probably got, he, you know, anytime you, you come against something that's not, you know, the norm is going against the grain a little bit. Challenge is going to come. So, so what hard, hardships did he face? Did, were there hardships when this came out? And then how did he persevere through those? Well, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty interesting. Uh, he recognized it was going to be uh, severely criticized. Right. But he didn't take it personally at all. Oh, he okay. Just, his, ver- his view was sanctify Christ in your heart. You do, because in the end, it doesn't matter what other people say. It, it, it matters when you stand before God and he asks you, what did you do with the truth that I gave you? What did you do with the opportunities that I gave you? Did you stand firm on me and my word, or did you cower to people who you know, can uh, kill the body but not the soul? Right, right, right. And, and he, he just... He just didn't really care. He sounds like a just a uh, such a strong man, uh, con- full of conviction, and and he he was chasing and pursuing the right things, and the Holy Spirit was guiding him the whole way. I, and you know, in I think the, I think the the thing that uh, comes out in the book that I didn't really understand mm-hmm. was that you know when he became a Christian, he struggled because he got set to uh, fight in Germany right away. So he right. you know, struggled to, to be mentored. He came back from the army, was somewhat disillusioned. He didn't know what he should do. And um, then he uh, he read a book by Wilbur Smith that said, uh, therefore stand. And Wilbur Smith's uh, view was that Christians had conceded all critical thinking to liberals. and they said, we're just going to, you know, study the Bible and anyone that looks at science is evil. Mm. Uh, that's not really true. What we, what they needed is a new generation of, of people to, to really study the context and provide uh, technical arguments to counter unbelievers and their uh, opposition to the scriptures. Right. And he suddenly realized, here he was at Princeton, uh, and he had the opportunity to really use the skills he was learning and to use that to uh, to witness and to reach out to others and to approach these things. And when he went back to Princeton after, uh, you know, six months after he got back from World War II, he he hit that campus like a rocket shot out of a cannon. He was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, going to every Every dorm room, uh, talking to people, inviting them to Bible studies, right? Uh, uh, prayer meetings every night, uh, just organizing uh, people. And he, you know, he had his regular uh, school studies as well. He read Christian books. He continued that for the rest of his life. He was on fire. For the rest of his life, he never stopped. Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, I remember growing up, every time we would go out, he would have a pocket full of tracks and every person... He would talk to me. He said, yeah, I've got something special for you. He'd give them a track. There was a time here when he was here and um, we had him for Thanksgiving from Indianapolis to come to Pittsburgh. And he loved China. He loved Chinese foods. We took him out to a Chinese restaurant. And as usual, at the end, he said to the waitress, can you have the cooks and people come out? I'd like to talk to them for a minute. So they came out and he says, I've got the special track for you. And they said, we remember you from Indianapolis. (laughs) So that's that's the way he was. He was, and uh, he would be talking, and all of a sudden he would just start praying, and then keep talking. Yeah. And people didn't know if they should bow their heads or cl- or. And what they realized is he was in constant communication with God. It was, yeah. it was like Spurgeon said, <laughs> "Right, I never, pray, I never pray for more than one minute, mm-hmm. but there's not one minute that I don't pray." Right. And and that's who he was. He just uh, very. Uh, very humbling experience to see him and understand 
that God used him because he was a man committed and proven to be a good and faithful servant. And right. God gave him those opportunities that he gave no one else and had been preparing him right. and molding him and giving him different experiences and connections. Right. And uh, was able to uh, to produce this book. That's amazing. I also picked up, it sounded like he had a pretty good sense of humor. He did. He did. And uh, he was a joyful man. Uh, my grandfather was also uh, a very um, quick wit. Uh, right. Our name is Whitcomb, and he was known as Wit. Ah, uh, so okay. So it kind of runs in the family. And uh, we, uh, I remember as a, as a kid, or uh, probably in, in uh, junior high school, or so where we'd be around the table and we would just start hunting on each other's things and twisting stuff. And right. it, it was just laughing and laughing it was such a, but he, he loved that kind of thing. How do you think this book, you know, can actually serve the Christian community? What, what do you hope the Christian community gets out of it? Uh, there, you know, it, being dyslexic, I write pretty slowly. It took me almost 15 years to finish to, to write this book, and I did a tremendous amount of research. I also had the uh, unusual resource of my father keeping a diary his whole life uh, from age 11. So I had over 30,000 pages of, of uh, diary notes. He kept all the letters and everything like that. So it's a lot of information. Uh, but the book is not just about his life, but also his time. He grew up in China, and it was a it was a terrible time for the Chinese people. And, and and why were the Americans were there, and what was happening? Um, then the uh, the background of uh, Donald Fullerton, who was just an on fire um, bachelor who wanted young Princeton students to come to know the Lord, and right. he was a Princeton grad himself. And his background, and some of the other people he worked with. Um, there's you know, what happened with him in the army and why did he end up in Germany and how did that mold his life? And so there's a lot of background information, but there's also some discussion of some uh, theological principles that are princ yeah, principles that uh, he taught me and I think are relevant. Uh, just things about uh, Christian organizations and some of the uh, problems there are the correct way to defend the Bible. So there's a section on uh, how the Bible should be approach and how you, you should use it to uh, uh, witness to other people and what it can and can't do. And so uh, I think there's a lot of teaching there. There's a lot of uh, footnotes for people who don't have a, a a background in a lot of this information. So I mean, what is the difference between uh, exegesis and hermeneutics? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's kind of an, a, an important distinction. And so there's explanations for those kinds of things. As uh, as you go through, right, right, absolutely. I tell you, it was it was phenomenal. I'm curious, what what were you what most surprised you by doing all your research, all those writings for, that your father had? What was the biggest surprise for you through the process? Um, I I didn't really know him before okay. that. When you're a kid growing up, you know, people say, well, "Do you know who your dad is?" And I'm thinking, "Yes, you know, do you know who your dad is?" I, you know, you don't know. It's just right. that's your world. Uh, but being able to take a step back, uh, spending years with my own family and other things, and then circling back again and uh, beginning to work with that and uh, to work with him uh, on it, it was, first of all, he he just was shocked. He was shocked I got to medical school. He was shocked I got into Duke University. And he was shocked I could write a biography because his memory of me was, you know, getting F's on writing and can't spell anything. Right. It, so I, I don't know. Um, he didn't realize the positive effects of coffee. <laughs> but, uh, you know, having a chance to to to, uh, to demonstrate that uh, he was also very careful. Um which was not my hope, but he really didn't change anything that I wrote. He corrected spelling errors and things like that and, and uh, was, you know, was supportive 
And uh, sometimes, you know, I'd, I would ask them specific questions before writing things for perspective and, right. and mm-hmm. those kinds of things. I, I mostly got the admonition from him um, not to criticize anybody, uh, not to highlight him, but really focus on Christ and what Christ is doing. Right. Right. I'd say, can I criticize Hitler? He goes, in what way? I'm going that he was bad. All right. You know? Just joking a little bit, but uh, you know he 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 was um, very appreciative of that and felt like there were things that uh, God had done for him that could be an encouragement to other people. Yeah. And I 100 percent agree. Um, just just a, yeah. an outstanding example of a man of God, how he became that man. Right. And um, you know he wasn't an alpha male. He wasn't uh, aggressive. He was actually uh, pretty reserved. Yeah. And, uh, but he was, he just stood on the Bible and that was it. He just, you know, made sure that, that he was careful in articulating exactly what the Bible said on each point and just let the Holy spirit do the pounding. Right. Right. Hey, let's take our last break. Outside of God's word, what should you be reading to grow as a Christian leader? It can be daunting to see all the options available these days. To help bring you some sanity to your search, we compiled all of our featured books of the week so you can make wise choices and strengthen your mind. The topics range from health, wealth, and self, so there's something there for all you guys. Whether you're looking for books for yourself or maybe you're researching ideas for other men, this is going to be a resource that brings you value. So check out the lionwithin.us forward slash book to see what would serve you the best right now and start sharpening your mind to be that leader you're predestined to be. That's the line within dot us forward slash book to learn more. So Dr. Wickham, I'm curious on the end, share with us, you know, there's a, there's a special moment at the end of your book where your father reviewed the last manuscript and I'll just, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. So, um, the book goes from 1924 to 1961, and there's actually so much more of his history. I'm working on a follow-up uh, volume of that, and that's really about his teaching and his passion right. on how to prepare materials to teach others and the more than 1,000 men that he personally taught. So um, the first part of the book really wraps up with uh, the publication of the Genesis Flood because that mm-hmm. was a, uh, a major achievement in his life and what he knew. Um, as he was getting older and suffering from Parkinson's disease and, you know, old age, uh, he became more and more interested in, in, uh, seeing the book completed and would call me up every Sunday and say, you know, um, how's, how are you doing? And how's the book coming? Right. So I hate to ask. How <laughs> coming. So I, I really took some time and, and wrapped it up. And, uh, in, uh, January of, of 2020, I drove from Pittsburgh to Indianapolis where he was staying and handed him this big uh, manuscript and said, there it is. I said, I've got this. uh, I finished the book. And uh, there were some chapters that he was uh, still hoping to be able to review. So he got right at it. Uh, On the uh, night of February 4th, uh, my my brother, whose house he was uh, staying in, um, heard him up at about 10 o'clock at night, which was unusual. And so he went to uh, see how dad was doing and dad was up and looked, uh, uh, you know, usually uh, alert yeah. and satisfied and took the last chapter. And he says, this is the final chapter. Gave it to my brother and said, I'm finished. Went to bed and died in his sleep. Wow. That's so powerful. And, powerful. And that was it. Yeah. Everything that he had before him to accomplish was accomplished up till the last minute. And when he was done, God took him to his reward. What a powerful story. What a powerful story. Guys, this has been, you, you got to get a copy of this. Now we do do something, Dr. Whipcomb, on the, the line within us. We call it feeding time. It's a, it's a quick fire round at the end of, of every interview. If you're willing to jump in, we'll do that. That sounds great. All right. 
So what's your favorite thing about God? I am I am amazed at his his power and wisdom, which is beyond anything we can imagine. And as a biologist and a physician, every time I study things, I just praise him because it's perfectly designed. Yeah. It's incredible. It's awesome. And it is more incredible than you can imagine. And it's self-replicating. And, and he's just, you know, he's such a great God. And the fact that he's also a loving and caring God and right. a personal God, just overwhelming. What's your least favorite thing? You know, it, it's, um, I wouldn't say there's a least favorite thing. So there's things that are perplexing. Yeah. Why, why is sin rampant? Why does he allow mankind to circle down the drain? Right. Why does he allow Satan to run rampant and to be the God of this world? Right. And I know that he knows what he's doing. Yeah. But those are things that uh, are perplexing. What are you struggling with right now? Retirement. Okay. <laughs> I've got, um, I'll be retiring from uh, the university in about six months. Um, I've got uh, two companies I've started I'm working on, uh, but there's just so much that I'm fascinated by and would like to study a little bit more and uh, things that, um, you know, I'll be able to do uh, that I hope to be able to do. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, there, uh, I want to spend time with my wife and my children and grandchildren and yeah. so, uh, just, you know, it's just a change of life. So that's kind of a, a, um, and, and watching my um, 401k go down the drain is uh, yeah an interesting observation yeah. as well. No, no doubt, no doubt. It's a tough time for sure. What's a new habit that you want to create this year? Uh, less stress and more exercise. <laughs> is there any particular kind of exercise that you enjoy? Um, I like walking. Uh, uh, just it's a chance to sort of unwind. Yeah. And, watch things go by and you know, it's, uh, I enjoy that. Okay. So the, the last question, Dr. Wickham, what is one thing you hope that the listeners out there remember from today's conversation? Um, my, you know, the, I think the Genesis flood is a, an extremely important book as it's really stood the test of time. Uh, I would hope that they would read about John Whitcomb uh, as a man struggling to find his way, growing up, going through different circumstances, didn't understand, but was committed to God and to his work all the time. And I think that is going to be a great encouragement and a model right. to other people. And that that is just so important and so missing. And uh, there's such so few examples of godly people that we can look to and learn from uh, people who have, have got it right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so from that standpoint, I think is an incredibly important role model. No doubt. His, uh, he himself had uh, four or five men that uh, were available to him that he learned from. And there, there's not many uh, others that give the depth and and um, diversity and and uh, intensity that that he had, but I think he would be a tremendous uh, example, especially for for people in in high school and yes. college, young career. I, yeah. I just see that as a as an important contribution. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. So, where do you want people to go to connect with you? Where do you want them to go to get the book? We'll make sure the links in the show notes. I just I wasn't sure. Is there anywhere you want them to that you'd recommend people to go find more information? Uh, the book can be purchased uh, on Amazon. Uh, you can get it at a little bit of a discount at Whitcomb Ministries, uh, or which is a, a website, or the um, masterbooks.com. Okay. okay. So those places uh, have it online, and uh, that's probably the best way to get it. Okay. I'm going to make sure we sync that up in the show notes. Is there anything else, Dr. Whitcomb, that you'd like to share on the line within us today? Um. I think we've hit a couple interesting things. Uh, there's certainly uh, volumes more we could talk about, yeah. and even the whole issue of creation and evolution and what the scientific evidences are and those kinds of things. Uh, 
you know, is a, a fertile area, but um, uh, I think we hit the highlights uh, about this book and, and why it's important. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you, sir, and thank you for joining Lion Within Us. Thank you so much for having me. Is your daily routine setting you up for success or failure? Each day is an opportunity to improve, and it starts with solid habits. We created a guide that outlines nine powerful habits that will strengthen the physical, mental, and spiritual areas of your life. To get your free guide, check out the link in the show notes or hop over to the lionwithin.us slash habits. That's the lionwithin.us slash habits and start creating the habits you need to be the leader you're predestined to be. All right, guys, that was a great conversation with, with Dr. Wickham. I tell you what, I told you, I told you it was going to be heavy. He went through a lot of different areas. His dad, what a phenomenal man. Just think about the opportunity to be able to go back and look at that much of your dad's history, all those diaries, and unpack it, and to be able to sit down with your dad and, and, and have him read his testimony. And at the very end, the final chapter, he says, this is finished. And then he passes on, and he's in glory. So I hope you got a lot out of this conversation. I really high, highly encourage you guys to check out the book. Uh, the question of the week this week, how does serving others look like in your life? So how does serving others look like in your life? Think about that. So guys, share the line within us. Go out there right now, send a text message to a buddy. Go, you know, Give us a five-star rating and review. Uh, it'd be great if you went to the line within us, checked out our resources, our Bible study, our blogs, our our, our uh, online courses, guys, we're building everything to serve you. I know this week was a little bit different, and guys, I appreciate you guys hanging with me. I've had a terrible cold, and but I had to power through this one. So again, sorry for the voice this week. I promise we're going to try to get better in the future, but I didn't want to hold this back. I wanted to get this recorded so we could get this out to you guys. So thank you again. Keep on coming back. Come back for Friday for our fun Friday. Now get your butt out there and unleash the lion within.